first thing I'd like to do is just to get your name, first yeah. and last name and correct spelling so I have that on tape. Okay. So if you could do that for me, please. My name is Atsushi Kiyuchi, spelled Atsushi, A-T-S-U-S-H-I. The last name is Kiyuchi, K-I-U-C-H-I. Great. Um, now, you were born... In Sacramento, California. In Sacramento? Work, and that's a, a whole different crew push up. It's getting to more showbiz now. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the... Um, so you were born in, in, in Sacramento then? Yes, I was born in Sacramento, California on January 9, 1930. Uh, I consider myself one of, I'm just a little bit after Tom Brokaw's depression, <laughs> the greatest generation, because I come, I, I come in that era where I grew up. I, I, I think we're considered like a, in a depression era kid, because we grew up in the depression area. My folks raised us during the deepest part of the uh, uh, depression. But our depression, we also had our war, which is the Korean War, as you go through. <laughs> and so everybody had a turn at, a, as, at some sort of a world conflict. But uh, like I say, it was my dad I went through all this, my mother, dad, my mother. Uh, my mother, dad was born in America, unusually, July 4th, in, in 1906. And the reason why he came, he was born in America, unusual circumstances, because actually the big migration of the Japanese, uh, people of Japanese ancestry, Started, came in the late in the 30s, about the 20s, 30s. But my dad, my grandfather, was one of the first ones in 1886. If you recall your history, they had the Chinese Exclusionary Act, and they decided the Chinese were taking all the businesses and all the you know so forth and cheap, cutting the labor down, and so they had the Exclusionary Act. And then, uh, in all the infinite wisdom, they discovered that they got rid of all the cheap labor. So they had the Gentlemen's Agreement going back to Admiral Perry, and uh, with Japan, and. Uh, they were going to open up Japan, you know, <laughs> civilize it, make them civil, civilize them. And, and, and so, and about uh, right before the turn of the century, my f grandfather came with his wife, with his wife, and they, they had five children that was born in the United States, which is very unusual. So my dad was actually a Nisei, a second generation already, and he had his citizenship. My mother came from a different, she was the one of the original, not the one of the original, but the last of the photo, picture postcard. She was born in uh, Shizuoka Prefecture in Japan. Um, and the little town, a little village called Shimizu. And that's where my f father's folks also came from, from that general area. And uh, she came here, uh, and she was born in 1908. And she came here, uh, there were five Takahashi girls that were then, <laughs> and they were a bane to the family. Uh, the out outcome for, the, for my mother was very, very, uh, not very promising because the, uh, after the five girls, uh, the Takahashi's finally had one son. And of course, the son took over all the family properties and, run, and to this day, he still runs the family business in uh, the properties in, in, in back in Shizuoka Prefecture. But anyway, so my mother had to have five sons, something to do, so they made an arranged marriage, uh, arranged marriage with a photograph of my mother. It was sent to my dad who was here in the United States. My dad did go back to Japan for a short time. But he basically um, came back, and they lived in San Francisco. My mother came over uh, to um, not Alice Island. Yeah, no, it wasn't not Alice Island. The, the, the equivalent of Alice Island in San Francisco, and and met my mother, met my father there, and they were the first time they were met. We have a photograph of my mother, all dressed up in her her finery. She was uh, 18 years old, so this would be about 19, about 19, 27, 28 somewhere, and it shows her in her. Close hat, you know, that was very, and then kind of this imitation uh, velvet coat, heavy fur coat, and carrying a bag of uh, oranges in her hand, and she looks very, you know, uh, with a little smile, a shy smile, as only a, <laughs> a new bride could be, and it's taken at uh, Golden Gate Park. And of course, this came during the Depression. Uh, my, my, I'm one of uh, nine children who were born to the family, and two of them died. And so there were seven of us that the, uh, from the family. We came, my, my folks came up into the Puyallup Valley area working on farms and uh, farm labor is what they basically were during the Depression. And I think we lived in from about 1933 to 1936. We lived in the Auburn Puyallup Fife area working on farms. I still drive one, uh, drive Highway 167 occasionally, well, quite a bit to go to see my daughter in Bellevue. And, we passed a farm that, you know, there's a freeway going, you know, Highway 61, the West Valley Highway goes through that area now, but I look back and I wonder now, which one of these farms that no longer, which one of these warehouses are the side, side of the farms that 
sure, you know, I grew up in when I was a kid. So we moved to Seattle in 1936. Did you realize as a kid that the Depression was going on, or were you just a kid and that's the way life was? I remember that uh, uh, Japanese are somewhat like, I, I would say Catholics or something, but, it means, but we take care of ourselves. The families help out, you know, put jobs, and I know we lived in a lot of sh little shacks and barns and a little sheds and stuff along the farms to, uh, while we lived, because the, the families, with, the Japanese families will look after each other. And, uh, the, the, but yeah, I remember uh, my dad was too proud to take, uh, of course, we had social programs, or food baskets and that type of thing, and welfare and stuff like that. But my dad was too proud to do that. That wasn't one of the ways we lived. That was our, part of our culture. So, anyway, so my dad was frequently gone. My mother basically raised us for, because my dad during those year, era was always looking for jobs and going around. And matter of fact, we lived in Auburn in 19, August 10th, 1936, 35, 35, we moved to Seattle. And remember, I, I remember that as my dad had already gone to Seattle looking for a job. And my sister, Lillian, was born the next day. And so the first stop we made was to a midwife in, in Seattle, uh, down there between 12th and, 12th and Jackson and 12th and, which is called the uh, International, the, on the outskirts of the International District. And we yeah. lived there from 1935 <coughs> to 1942. No, so what was your dad, when he went to Seattle, what was he doing? For well, him? at that time he was driving a, 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 a wooden, wooden coal fuel truck and deli making deliveries and uh, off of a big truck and he came to get us in this great big truck. And remember my dad was smaller now, he was about five foot three, two or three and he used to carry these big, and sometime when they would, at the end of the day, you know, he wouldn't maybe to make his deliveries. So he'd bring the big coal, uh, coal truck with either slab wood or coal, and he'd carry these these 50 pound bags, cans of coal up the stairs, up to the apartment houses and so forth like that. And that's what he did. And then he also went to the can, he went to the canneries in Alaska. For two summers he spent with the canneries to working with Filipinos and, and we had, we had quite a collection of friends that lived, came to visit us and stayed with us uh, during that time. But my mother worked all the time. She worked, uh, and uh, one of my jobs was when, we, in the summertime, we, my mother would go work out in the farms around uh, where the Boeing Field is actually, <laughs> down there where stern off metals uh, places down there on the Fourth Avenue or First Avenue South, Fourth Avenue South, back in there, and she, we would work, and we would actually go in the summertime. So. I was always the next one. My mo my sister, oldest sister, Sonia, so I had to take care of the household, and so mom would go work and actually live there. And we would live in Puyallup and in Fife and around in the south, what we call South Park, uh, in that area. And um, I would go and take care of the little one, the littlest baby, because there was always another baby coming along. And, uh, long, and so we would spend our summers, we were actually living out on these farms and uh, doing the farm work. Was it, was it fun or was it hard as a child? Uh, I think I don't think we were. Our, our, you know, you look back and say, "Well, was it tough times?" Everybody said it was a tough time. It was a tough time for my parents, I'm sure, because my dad, you know, all these things. And then uh, things started getting better. About 1940, my dad started got a two la two lawnmowers and a clipping, and started start, start going around uh, collecting, uh, going getting j uh, jobs as a gardener. And so about 1941, and don't remember, we, our, our family was not unusual. Everybody in the United States that were, you know, we were coming out of the Depression, and things were tough, jobs were hard to find, and yet, uh, you know, we survived it as kids. We were survivors of the Depression era, basically, and things were starting to look good for us. Uh, you know, like I said, he bought a 1929 Chevrolet pickup truck uh, and uh, van, the small Chevrolet delivery truck is what it was. And we would go all over Seattle, up and down the hills. And, and, and you know, my job, I was only, what, six years old? Well, I was about, oh, five, it was six or seven, eight, eight years old or so. My job was we'd go to these big fancy uh, houses, homes along West Seattle and Queen Anne Hill and all uh, uh, Highlands, uh, Kent Highlands and so forth. And my job was to usually have a big, I, I would go down and pack down all the molehills so that the, my dad could make, and don't forget, we didn't have power mowers, and so, you know, he, he did that by hand, and all the trimming, and, and I got so I could do the trimming around the, uh, uh, around the, uh, I, I, you know, the, the guards, these big estates that we worked in. 
But things were starting to look good for us, and uh, Pop, Dad, and Mom had a full, steady job as a chambermaid in one of the hotels, making beds and so forth. Uh, and uh, and it was the, she would get us off to school, and then, then she'd be back before uh, three, four, three o'clock. And and uh, so things were starting to look real good for. Her. And I think all of us, and all of us in America, 1940, 41, things were starting to look better for all of us. And of course, uh, then came Pearl Harbor, and that was a different story altogether. Now, um, you talked about living in what's now the International District. Did you find yourself living in uh, a, a Japanese community where you went? Was that a close-knit community, or, or or was that when you moved different places? No, in our area, it was basically, I think there were <laughs> Weller Street. We lived on Weller Street for about four years, four of the uh, years that we lived there before the war. And uh, there was a... Uh, Native American family that followed the crops, and so they would come in every f after uh, after about October or November. His name was Percy, and Percy would come, and he lived a couple of houses up from us. And we had a black family, and uh, she uh, she lived with a longshoreman, and he'd come in, and you, I mean uh, with a seaman. He was actually a seaman. You would see him coming coming off the ship, coming down. So I see the Skinners have their you know fathers there now, or so forth. And we had Japanese, Chinese. We had the only guy we used to pick on is, and I hate to admit this, was we had one white family. And he was different, see, and he was different, and so, there's a lot, and so we made him the butt of all our jokes. And it was, she was quite a lady, though. I, I'll give her credit there. She uh, every Fourth of July and Memorial Day, she, she was a World War One nurse, and so she put on her nurse's cape, you know, her black and in her uniform of, a, uh, of an army nurse. And whatever it was, and we'd see her going off to join and go to the parade downtown, you know. But his, we, uh, his name, I forget what his name was. We used to call him Lucifer for some reason or the other. I don't know why we called him Lucifer. But he was usually the butt of all our jokes and stuff. And, yeah, and we had, like I say, we had a, a, quite a collection. This was between 12th and 14th uh, on, on Waller Street. Uh, that's where we lived, spent most of the time there. That's where we lived. And that, but like I said, things were starting to look better for us then. And then Pearl Harbor happened. Do you remember where you were? Well, how old were you in Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor, I was 12 years old. 12 years old, so about 6th, 7th yeah, grade. Yeah, roughly. yeah. No, I was in the 6th grade. 6th grade. Uh -huh. and okay. Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, it was on December 7th, of course, on a Sunday. And we every Sunday we went down to the Atlas Theater, and it's located on Maynard and, and uh, between Jackson and King. And it's where, right across, right close to the... Uh, Wing Luke Memorial uh, Museum downtown International District, and the Alice Theater uh, was right across the street. And they had a double feature every time, and about two hours of cartoons. So every Sunday, that was a tradition. We'd, we'd get a, it cost us I think a nickel, and we would spend the whole after whole afternoon Sunday afternoon going to see the double feature and all the <laughs> coming events and the cartoons and the newsreels and you know it was almost a three hour deal there and uh, rain or shine on Sunday that was standard so my sister would take us and George and I my kid brother and I and our little sister if she was going so and it gave the, my folks some time off too so we would go dry walk down there and, and we came out of the theater on December seventh. And things were real funny there. And we walked up Jackson Street, you know, which is the main, uh, from up Jackson, you know, which is the main area now in Seattle. It goes right down to the Kingdom and that Jackson. And we were walking up from, and from, from it would be about 7th Avenue, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and we lived on 14th. Between. And I think the first inclination we heard was somebody said, you goddamn Japs. Look what you did, and we didn't know what was happening. And of course, we're you know I'm 12 years old, 13 years old, and we saw a couple guys throwing windows through uh, rocks through the windows of the Japanese stores that Mr. Mr. Mur the Murakami store and a bunch of other stores up there along the way. And little restaurants were all along the way, up on Jackson, and and uh, oh, you know, and there was a lot of hostility. And we didn't know, and the, the streets were basically, and the, and the Japanese stores, the stores that usually were open on Sunday, were closed. Which was unusual because it was open when we walked down, so we always walked, and and uh, and I think finally we got home, and uh, my dad was uh, said, "I can't believe it! I can't believe it!" And, and he had his he had the radio on, no TV, <laughs> had the, had the and the telephone calls, and could you believe it? It happened, and so forth and so on. And that's our first inkling of, of, of Pearl Harbor. That was December seventh. The next morning, I remember, our school was Bailey Gatz's school. I wrote an article for the CLPI about our graduation day. 
It was in the Times. Anyway, uh, the next day, we, we went to Bailey Gatchet Elementary School, which is on, at that time the first, uh, it was a, it's actually the Seattle second Bailey Gatchet School. There's a third Bailey Gatchet School now. But the Bailey Gatchet was located on 12th, uh, 12th and uh, 12th and Weller, 12th and Weller, right on the corner. It's an Indian uh, center now for the city of Seattle right there. Well, that whole building uh, has been remodeled, but that's where they, they saved the doors, the front doors to, for the facade of the, and uh, Miss Mahan was an Irish, I was an Irish maid, uh, old Irish, not old, I thought she was old, white haired Irish matron, spinster, I call her, spinster. And she ran that school with an iron fist, and, and everybody knew the Asians, and the school was 99 and 9 tenths percent uh, non white. Chinese, Japanese, predominantly Chinese, from the Chinatown came up when we came, and maybe a few uh, uh, blacks. Not, not very many, some blacks, but it was mostly Asians. And she called us all in and she had an assembly right there. And I remember she brought us together and she was in the assembly room and she talked about, you know, they were all, she says, we don't care what's happened in the world, we should be caring, but then she says, when you're in my school, you're my children. We always were children. And she was like a mother. I mean, she was, she was the link between, uh, she was, for most of us, uh, though, she was the link between the, the white world and the Asian world. Because you got to remember, see, we're all second generation, more, and and so we were still, we st were still like ESL. We were English as second language for most of us. English was still a second language, and so we had to make that transition. And Miss Man helped, and she says, and she was known as Pan Sensei. And if you followed up, if something happened, you were bad. She would come down and talk to you, to your folks. And God, that was, you know, I had that <laughs> more than once. But, I mean, when Miss Mahan Sensei came to your house, boy, I mean, she was the king, the police, the enforcer, the social worker, the everything for the whole community. And I, I always, and she, she, she's left a heritage to uh, many of the uh, Nisei nations in, in the community. Uh, and uh, it was, it, she was a remarkable person. And the Chinese started wor working uh, there was a lot of confusion between Japanese and Chinese because we all look alike, you know, we all look alike. And so the Chinese started coming, uh, the Chamber of Commerce or something came out with little buttons that said China on it because we had a curfew. And Japanese could not be out, out, out on the street after, after sunset. And we had to turn in our radios and our guns and any weapons we had and any, um, the whole thing. Anyway, um, and so Miss Mann, for, when they first showed up, Miss Mann said, no, take it off. She said, you're my house. We're all one family. We're all the same. And she would not let the kids uh, wear the China button, Chinese buttons. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I remember we, uh, uh, the Ch our Chinese friends would loan us the China button, and we'd go down to see the show and so forth <laughs> in the evening. But, uh, yeah, it, it was quite, an, uh, it was quite, quite a time. Uh, I was going to say something. Did, did she, Miss Man, did she talk about kind of, what was happening in the outside, when I say outside, well, I mean outside your classroom to say, you know, to talk about the issues, the, um, the prejudice that you're facing. In no, like she that. didn't. Or she just protected you. She just kind of protected us and made help, help made it easier for us. I remember, and we, we, we were all one family, we were treated like family, so that, you know, if anybody got in trouble or anything like that, she would intervene for us. Uh, and she... Um, she, she, she used to have, and she always represented the better things. We always kind of looked up to her. And, uh, and her teachers did the same thing. And I remember one time when I was in the third, no, it was about the second grade, Miss Ide. Miss Ide, and this is 1940, 40, 41. And Miss Ide took us, for, we got permission from our mothers, and she took the whole class. And there was, must have been about 20 of us. And we walked from Bailey Gatchett School, it was on 12th and Weller, and we walked up to, where's Capitol Hill now, you know, the Capitol Hill area, the, the apart, to this, her, her apartment that she lived in. It was a high-rise apartment, and it's, the building is still there. I could still, and you go up, up Capitol Hill, and then you go up uh, level off, and it's, so, uh, it's about, so, it was somewhere around Madison and uh, on, uh, where is it, uh, Boren. It was on Boren Avenue and around, but there's, there's a bunch of beautiful, old, still high-rise apartments, and we got, to, and we went up to her house. And she sat us down, and we all had hot chocolate. And, I was, what the heck is hot? And, and then we all held hands, and she just, 
and so we just, you know, all for us, who lived in, you know, the blacks and whites and the Asians and everything, it was just a rele revelation that people lived like this, you know, that, 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 that these things are. And I think the whole thing was the idea that we could do better, you know, and we could rise up above this, and we could also, and she took us all back down and get down there. But I, I remember those little things that they, and she used to have a collie dog, a collie dog, you know, and the collie would come down, and she just occasionally, she had also had a chicken, Miss Mayhem did, and she would bring it to school, and, and, you know, and I, we all have dogs, right, at home, but a collie dog, and this is even before Lassie, you know, <laughs> before Lassie, and we said, gee, man, yeah, what a beautiful animal, we just, and he would, and he was well trained, and he'd come in and, and sleep, and lie down in, in the classroom, and everybody said, oh yeah, the dog was over, I'm visiting our room, and so forth, and she even had a chicken, and the chicken used to be, and she used to be, bring the chicken in the cage, and bring it, and visit to the classrooms and stuff, and it was a reward, it was really a system of rewards for us, and uh, yeah, she, uh, I can't say enough about her. But. I was going to say, she sounds like a teacher that, uh, I, I think of the, the, uh, good, uh, um, the movie with Robin Williams, but there's this amazing teacher that really touches kids' Oh yeah, lives. the Last Poet Society. Yes, yeah, exactly. The, the Dead, Dead Poet Society. Society. Dead yeah. Poet, yeah. And this sounds like one of those mm -hmm. teachers that had this life effect on you. Yeah. Was the, the, when you were coming back from the, the theater and, and, and the people were saying those goddamn jabs, was that the first time that you had experienced prejudice that you can remember, or had you faced that prior to? No, yes. The answer is yes. We lived, you know, the Japanese... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> We lived in not uh, an enclave or anything like that, but we we basically lived in that area, and we all it was cut out. If you went to Bailey or there's several central schools, there's several schools that served that area, and then you either went to Garfield High School or you went to a Broadway High School, uh, which is the it's in vocational tech uh, uh, central South Central Washington Central Seattle Community College now. But there, so it was pretty well, that's where most of them lived. A few lived on the outskirts around Queen Anne Hill or, or uh, up on Beacon Hill and then went to Cleveland the High School or something like that. But most of us were basically in that area. But we never saw it as being a, you know, a, a ghetto or such as that. That was just the way things were. And, then, and, and uh, kids were starting in, in that era too. See, there are kids like, uh, kids who are going to school now and there's kids going to college, starting going to college. University of Washington and, and uh, you know, to better themselves. They were the older kids and uh, uh, there's always just some wonder why would we bother to spend the money sending your kid to college. But that's two things. My mother, my, our parents, the Japanese culture, I think, I can speak, I think, there are a couple things that were guiding principles in our family. And uh, one of them was, number one was don't disgrace the family name. Don't disgrace the family name. And that was, you know, and you think about it today, yeah, you know, the standards. That was really a strong, strong, and, and I think all of us lived by that very strongly. The second one was get a good education, to do better, to do better for ourselves and get a good education. I never, I didn't finish college till uh, uh, 1980, 98. I was the oldest graduate for Evergreen State College this year, uh, two years ago, 1998. And I was, I was, I was what, uh, seven, I was 68 years old. And I, it was something that I remembered, and I was retired by then, and I was not comfortable, but I was all right. I was, you know, I don't know. But I, it was just stuck in my mind, and I always tried to, I took part-time courses, and finally went up, and, and I walked across the graduation, received my diploma with my granddaughter. Oh, wow. Yeah, I walked over. You're, so I'm doing the math now. You're over 70? I'm You're 70, 71 years old. You're kidding me. Mm -hmm. You're lying to me. Yeah, I'm 71. I was born January 9, 1930. Man. So, so I was, you know, I, I hate this, what, whatever you get out of this interview. You got to remember that I was 12, 13, 14, and 15 when, they, when the war came and we were interned. So for me, it wasn't too bad. You know, there was a lot of things. But don't forget, when you're about 15 years old, for about that age, you think about girls, sex, smoking, and becoming socially adjusted to, to the world that you live in. So your memories, so my memories are very strong about camp, although, and I, I reflect back the things I've read now, and I've become, I read a lot, and s a scholar of things that have happened to us during that time, and it's been kind of a, a not a hobby, it's more than a hobby that I go out and talk to people about it, because the main thing I want to stress that while I was only 
at that age, at a very, very young, impressionable age, very impressionable age, he starts to, but my father was 36 years old, and he's got five kids, and one day they say, sell your business, you know, which is, was not much of a business, I mean, there are other people, businessmen that, are, that you know, had a lot of money tied up and stuff like that, but one day they tell you, you got three months to get rid of everything you got. Theoretically, yeah, three months. So Executive Order 9066 was signed on February 19, uh, 1942 by President Roosevelt. And that gave the military authority in the region, the senior military authority in the region, uh, to decide what is best for the security reasons. And General DeWitt in San Francisco, 5th Army, decided that the best course to, to uh, protect the United States was to move all the people of Japanese American ancestry, Japanese ancestry uh, off the West Coast. Proved to be a lie. It was an illegal decision he made, and uh, it took till 19, he did it 1942, and I think it was 1984 that the federal uh, courts found that the, they filed what is known as a writ of, writ of discovery, or called, I'm gonna mispronounce it, it's a Latin word for, it's called quorum nobis that when they made the decision, the court was not given the full package of information that it was supposed to have, and it was actually withheld by the United States Army, that the, United, that the Japanese Americans did not pose a threat to the national security. And that was the result of the, then they, in 1986, then they filed the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1986. And that was the redress for the, what's it called? And DeWitt was the one, didn't he change it? Because wasn't it originally, didn't it say something like, uh, uh, it, it didn't just narrow down the Japanese mm. population. No. And DeWitt was the one that came in and put. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it was, his, it was his call as a senior army commander. But the, the, there's congressional hearings plus the court. And this is an interesting story because a group of young uh, in California, law students, Japanese. And one of the things they said, why, did you, why don't you, you know, these are by then their sensei, the third generation. Why didn't you tell me about this, Dad? mom and dad. And that was, we, it was kind of a shameful thing, really, it was. And, and, and I didn't go public until 1984, when the redress movement was moving in the court. And the court, courts were holding, uh, the Congress was holding congressional hearings throughout the United States. And the, the, the Olympian reporter, whom I knew from my connections working with the state, uh, asked me about it. When they said, weren't you one of those guys who were in the camps? I said, sure. What do you want to know? And it, and it, but you got to remember, but my dad was 19, was 36 years old, and he's got five kids in one day. So, and his business is just starting. I don't know how old you are, Carl. 42. Okay. So six years older than your dad. Yeah. Was. And then one day they say you got three months to sell your business and get the hell out of here and get off. And you don't know where you're going to go. You don't know what you got to do. You don't know what's going to happen to you. There are three prevailing rumors. The first rumor was they're going to round us up and put us on a boat and take us, send us to Japan. Don't forget, there's 120,000 people involved here. 120,000 people. I looked it up to you just today, just before I came to see you. 100,000, 100, that's about the same population of Whatcom County. Wow. Bellingham, or Bellingham. And there were 7,000, approximately 7,000 people in the camp. I came out of Seattle. And 7,000 is just a little bit under the population, total population of Tumwater. That's a lot of people. I and mean, we're talking about all kinds of people. Japanese, that are beggarmen, lawyers, Indian, not Indian, excuse me, lawyers, thieves, merchants, doctors. So he just, he just picked it up and moved us. The army moved. And it seems because I like your juxtaposition. I like you talking about, you know, here you're a 12 year old kid, girls, smoking, mm -hmm. things like that. And here's your dad, 36, family started, business started. Can you remember? Did your dad talk about it, or, I mean, do you know what your dad was yeah. thinking at the time? Uh, my dad was 36, and like I said, he was a Nisei, so, you know, he spoke, so he was kind of, he was very prominent in the JCL, Japanese American Citizens League, and there's been a lot of talk about that since then, that they were the Inus or the dogs that caused all this, because we demanded, that we said that since there was a, you know, Japanese are, are, are not great for organization, <laughs> you know, somebody taking hold and running things, you know, like, uh, you know. So there was a really, really loosely knit society of uh, uh, community, 
And the Japanese Americans were the Citizens League, where the English, kind of the more English guy, with the older, the older people, uh, Issei's and Nisei, older Issei's, which are the original, which are still non-citizens, but they came, were born in born in Japan. And then some of the senior uh, Nisei's, like my dad, and we said they were told, we were told that to co to show our loyalty, that we should cooperate and do what the, gov the government will not do anything to you that's bad. Rumor number one was they're going to round us up and send us to Japan. Rumor number two, they're going to round us up and put us in camp, and then after the war, we're going to Japan. And the third one was they were going to round us up and shoot us. I mean, it, that was that wild. We, nobody knew. See, you know how rumors start? They just knew we had to register, get signed up, take our shots. We didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't know. They just knew that we had 30 days to... And the funny, the ironic part of it, in the state of Washington, the Columbia River and the Columbia and the Snake River was the dividing line between those who have to be interned and those that didn't have to be interned. So Spokane was a safe haven. I have a friend of mine uh, uh, that lived in the Tri-Cities. His cousins <laughs> stayed. He had to go. That's right. Rich, Richland and Kennewick. Yeah. Yes or no? And I forget which way. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it was yeah. his... friend of mine, Clarence Mariwaki, maybe you know him. He used to... He's a, Public information officer, I think now for uh, the, the uh, rapid transit. I think that's what he's doing now, a friend of mine. But anyway, yeah, and, he, and we talked about it. But anyway, so here he got these young guys. So you talk to my dad and my family, okay? Then he got 17 and 18 year old kids that's going to college or got a job, just starting, got girlfriends, want to get married, have a family. That drastic of a change in their lifestyle, and so. You know, even when if you were a college graduate, if you're, if you're Asian, you know, your chances of getting in a professional engineer becomes a, uh, maybe works for a chain uh, survey crew or something like that. So those biases were still built in. So all of a sudden, one day, bingo, it's over. I mean, you know, so you don't know what's going to happen. Yet. So uh, we took our shots. We got family number. We registered family number 11518. And the poster that I brought to you, show, you read it very carefully. It says, it's a notice to all Jap people of Japanese ancestry, aliens and non-aliens. Do you know what a non-alien is? Uh, uh, well, it's be an American citizen, citizen. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's how the government comes. So all people of Japanese ancestry, aliens or non-aliens, will report to blah, blah, blah. And, it's, and we could take only what we could carry in our two hands. And today I think of, I always tell this to the high school kids when I give a talk. I said, if, you're gonna, if you were told to bring two things, take with you, two things, what would you bring that you could carry on you? That's all you could take. Your boom box, no pets are allowed. You can't take any pets. So out of this material world today, well, you wonder what, the kid, kid, what would the kids take? And so anything you could take. So, uh, my, so my, my, my sister, was, spoke, it was my oldest sister, was three years older. She kind of took hold of everything, and we went, get, got registered. Because my mother didn't speak English. My dad was busy helping others, families, to make that smooth transition, or whatever you want to call it, to, to, to be moved out with the JACL. And um, so well, on May, we left on May 8th out of Seattle and went to... Uh, and went to reported at tenth and tenth on Dearborn and tenth. The street is now blocked off, but that's the same place where I was a schoolboy patrolman at Bailey Gatchard is right up on the hill, and that's where that was the same place that was where I was a schoolboy patrolman. On May eighth, I we loaded on the buses there, and we went came to Puyallup, which is called Camp Harmony. Camp Harmony housed approximately seven thousand <clears throat> seven thousand uh, people from the northwest, including some uh, quite a few people from uh, Alaska. See, and the rule was, if you look up Schindler's list, the rule was, in Nazi Germany, if you had one sixteenth Jewish blood, if you were Japanese American, if you had one eighth Japanese blood, you went to the camp. And so we looked at some of these Alaskan guys, you know, and they're just look whiter than you. I mean, they're great big guys that worked in the woods and the minings, mines and fishermen and so forth. They were also there in this camp. And we lived and that was the town, like I said, so that's about that held about seven thousand, which is about the equivalent and area we were in area A, which is the main this is excuse me, this is the Puyallup Fairgrounds. 
if you're familiar with the fairgrounds, the kitty corner from the main exposition area where the main office is, was a, is a huge parking lot. That was area A, that's where you were in. Area B was right down, further down from the road, and it was a smaller parking lot. And then area C is where, if you were a high school kid from school, that's where the school buses and the, and the exhibitors parked back in the, on the other side of the exposition. And then the area D was the main exposition area where they took the horse stalls and the, underneath the bleachers and everything, they made rooms for and put up barracks up there overnight, and not overnight, but real quick, on a quick order, and their ship lap. And very crude, had, had a stove. And people say, well, what was, the, what was Area A like? And it's Area A and Area B and Area C, which is not the x -Men. It was everything like you see in Stalag 17 or Hogan's Hero. We had the whole bit. We had the searchlights. We had the 12 to 14-foot uh, barbed wire fences. We had armed guards, soldiers walking or patrolling the perimeter area. Um, we had mess halls. We ate in mess halls. And, uh, and it, was, it was the thing that it was a cultural thing, too, that we always, you know, we had a, what a per, per, the father was the dominant figure in our house. And no matter what time, we didn't eat till he came home. And this wasn't like, uh, you know, the Nelson family or anything. We didn't, oh, what did you do in school today, Beaver? I don't know. Did you? It wasn't one of those things. We waited until he came home. When he came home, he'd grab the newspaper, read the paper, and eat, and we'd eat in silence. But we waited for him. And there were a lot of family things that we did that way, and that was part of the culture. But the camp resulted in an absolute breakdown because then we had to go into the mess halls, and we da 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 And you had no privacy. And... Uh, it, it, we were there from uh, May 8th to August. We were there three months. Did the government know they were breaking the family unit down, or was it just ignorance and, and non-caring of... Well, oh, I, I think you got to... Uh, I don't think it was non-caring or ignorance. I think, how do you handle mass groups of people like that? And the only experience the government ever had was the, the CCC camps and the Army camps. And so it went run absolute army style. No. Now is so among this A, B, C, and D, are the fairgrounds still kind of in there too? I mean, because it was the fairgrounds. Yeah. Be, so are there still some of that? Like I don't know how old the roller coaster is, but I mean, yeah, they were still there. Yeah. So there's this kind of yeah. so the, weird. Yeah, I don't know if they had a Piala Fair because <laughs> we didn't leave there till August, and maybe I, I, I doubt if there was because uh, there's a war time. I think the thing that really got to me, I think, when you first realized it, it was like it was a lot of fun, I mean, for a kid 12 and 13, 12 years old. But I think the thing that really got me is that uh, on Sundays, you know, don't forget there's uh, oh, well, the two things. First of all, gas rationing and tires were hard to get during World War II. Those were. But some of our friends, Chinese friends and white friends, would bring us stuff, come in from Seattle, and they'd meet at the main gate, and they would talk to us through the gate, and then they would pass over diapers, things that we, did, we couldn't bring, towels, things, you know, and, and tell us what's going on with how's the business going on, you know, and how's things going on, how's school, and so forth. And they would pass it, and the guards would look at it, and then check it over, then hand it over to us. And so this it was like visiting day at the prison. I mean, let's be honest, that's what it was. And through the, and the thing, but the thing that got you, well, area A, one side of it was open right to the main drag of Puyallup. You know, if you go downtown Puyallup and you go to the fairgrounds, that's the main drag. And then it goes up on the hill, then it goes to South Hill. Okay. Uh, and, but the people used to come around, the white people used to come around on Sundays and weekends and, and say, whoo -ho, look at those Japs in there. Can you imagine what, how you would have felt? Especially when you're kids. kid. And so we were an attraction, like going to the zoo. We were an attraction, and uh, yeah, yeah we, had, we had curfew, and the people used to come by, and every night the block manager would come by and say, everybody knock at night, and say, everybody there? Why the hell could we go, for crying out loud? I mean, we were there, and the thing that I think I remember mostly, and like I said, it was like taking the whole town of Tumwater, okay, and put them in this one place. And so you got all kinds of people. You got a lot of college kids. You got high school kids. You got kids like this. You got babies, infants, pregnant mothers. Uh, so it was all just like just putting the, you know, the, if you can get. But I remember on Fourth of July in 1942, the young people, the college kids, and the younger, older, younger kids, and and don't forget our the parents, the older people were just basically devastated. They were just devastated. You know, they didn't know where we're going to go, what's going to happen to us. Da da da. Here we gave up everything. We're sitting here in this barracks and this, 
Uh, and so the young people kind of kept things going. And, and I've, uh, on the 4th of July, we had a, we had a, uh, a community gathering in the widest part in between the various section area. And they gathered there just for, and the kids put it on like a, you know, like a pep rally and, you know, all this stuff and music. And they, we had our band, orchestra, we had our form, they had form, their own orchestra. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that hard because we all came from the same area and we knew da 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 da. You know, we knew. And so, so, yeah, he plays the clarinet. Yeah, I remember he was on our band. We used to have a little uh, Nisei, all Nisei band, a real good, they played uh, uh, Glenn Miller Orchestra, uh, orchestrations, yeah. And so, they built this stage, big high stage, and they had this program, for a Fourth of July program. And we closed that program with it by singing God Bless America. I mean, the, 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 the irony that's there in, I don't understand. I mean, I, 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 yeah. did, I did, did, to see what the, especially with, especially when you broke it down into the older generation, the younger generation, you know, here your father is, is, uh, your, your second generation born over here, right? Your dad was born over here. And here's his country that said, the hell with you. We don't trust you. We're putting you in this cage for your protection, right? And yet, there's still a faithfulness, a patriotism, it sounded like. That's all we knew. We were born and raised that way. Uh, yeah, we had also, uh, there was, don't forget, don't get me wrong, we had what we, uh, what we called, we used to call them, you know, I'm 12, 14, 13, 12, anyway, but we used to have what we called the Can House Commentators. Uh, I, can't, I don't know if you get this on tape, but you know it was like an army base, right? You know, the, and the latrines were all community by you know and the mess hall was all, and so you had these stools, you know, commodes, toilet bowls, and so in the morning, early morning, all the older people would, and we kind of set it aside for them, you know, for their constitution, they'd sit there, and, and one of the, did you hear? I says, oh yeah, what's that? He says, I just heard that there took over Atu and Sitka, and they're moving down the peninsula and coming be a couple, and it won't be long before they're being hit in Washington State, coming down through Canada. They mean, of course, the Japanese Imperial Forces, see? <laughs> and these rumors, oh yeah, and they're, they're usually the older people, you know. And don't forget, these are old people, they're, you know, 70s and 80s, and the sons have taken over the business, and they're semi-retired after years of years of hard, hard, hard work and stuff, and all of a sudden, here they are. You know, the senior citizens. And, and, and you know, we can't send them to a Panorama City uh, Senior Citizens Day. At, well, there's nothing for them other than maybe they play checkers or go or, 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 or Hana or play Japanese games. But, so they say, yeah, is that right? Yeah. I, says, I heard that they were attacking and, that, you know, there's a, half the fleet's gone now. And the American fleet is... And so we used to call them the Can House commentators to get the latest dope on what's happening in this world today. You know. But then, then, there, then there was the next group that... Uh, uh, you know, and they were more or less semi-retired. These are the senior citizens, and they were, you know, mom, their kids had taken over the farm or the business, and so forth and so on. And so it was a real cool. cool they don't know. They didn't, you know. I'm sure they just wanted. Well, well, maybe we'll go back to Japan. And so there were there were loyal people too. You know, I mean, I mean, there are people who are loyal to America. And then we came. Uh, we left there in August. And went by troop train, and they it was an old, smelly old troop train, and two, I think it took us. And then we went to Idaho, Minidoka War Relocation Project. We were under the we were under the we were under the wartime civilian control administration WCCA while we were in Pure in Puyallup. And then the federal government formed the War Relocation Authority. And it was exactly relocation, so they brought everybody off the West Coast and. I forget how many assembly centers there were, like Puyallup, Tanfaran, some of the racetracks and fairgrounds through California and everything were all used for this purpose. Uh, uh, the first group to leave, leave, uh, leave uh, Washington State was the people from Bainbridge Island, and they went to Pinedale, California, which I, at this time, maybe I can put a plug in. One of the best, and I've read a lot of history and stories about them, the best probably thing that's out right now is snow falling off cedars. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to see it, and also read the book. Yeah, because yeah. the book has a lot yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, it has a lot more. But it does touch upon, uh, David Gooderson did a tremendous job on research about how the Japanese, and these, 
these are the strawberry farmers in Bainbridge Island. That's who that he's talking about. And he's talking about the, the editor of the paper, the Bainbridge, is the editor of the Bainbridge Review was the guy, Walt Woodward, who I had the fortune to meet after the war. And, uh, and, and the son, of course, in the story, in the book, the son takes over. But uh, uh, they did a tremendous job, and I always recommend that to, to the kids to read maybe, <laughs> maybe some of the parts a little, <laughs> a little sophisticated for, for them. But well, and, and I understand from that the government came and documented that because that was now the propaganda to come and to say, look at how well they behaved mm -hmm. leaving, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we want mm -hmm. you to do too. Yeah. You know? yeah. But then we went. Then we went to camp, and to, so we went to uh, Minidoka War Relocation Center, and there were ten of such relocation centers throughout throughout the United States, all the way from Arkansas to most of the in our, and California's Utah, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and uh, California, and uh, Yosemite National Park in that area. And when you say relocation, was that a, another center, or was that to now, quote, put you back into society. Put you, assimilate us, relocate, relocate us to anywhere except the West Coast. And the Department of Interior, if I, I think it was the Department of Interior, they ran. And there was a cadre of white people who ran the camp. It was like a big city. We were the second largest city in the state of Idaho, with 9,000 people. We were the second largest city. And there was near Twin Falls, uh, south north of Twin Falls. An interesting thing to have, I don't know, uh, this is taking much too long, I don't know. Uh, oh, that's uh, fine. Uh, 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 interesting thing to have to me. Uh, I went to, uh, I like to go back. When I go on vacation, when I, I always stop by where one of the camps are. And I went to Tula Lake, Washington, Tula Lake, uh, California, which is on the northern border. It's the garlic capital of the world, I think. They, at least that's what they say. But Tula Lake was the name of the camp. Uh, which, had to, which housed the diehards and finally decided to segregate the loyal, so-called loyal and the people who say, no, I won't be loyal to that. Anyway, and I went to Tula Lake and so went to the Chamber of Commerce and they said, oh yeah, we, yeah, go talk to the lady at the library. She's been old time here. She could tell you all about the camps. She could tell you all about the tent camps because and uh, so I went to see the lady, and I said, do you know anything about the camp? And I, was, I want to see some buildings or remnants of the building, of what the camp was. And, and she looked at me and says, I'll have you know the camp was at Newell, California, not here in Tula Lake. And I said, oh, uh, where's Newell? Let's go down the highway about a mile and a half. Just utter denial. Really? Yeah. Then, then, to the lake, welcome to the lake. It's a big to water tower there. But yeah, she was correct because it was at Newell, which is a half a mile or a mile down the road from Tule Lake. And so she didn't want to be known that Tule Lake be known as the, where the camp was. And the same thing happened to me in, uh, in Twin Falls, Idaho. I went up there and I wasn't quite sure where the camp was at Minidoka, where we were. And I asked the gas guy at the gas station, never heard of it, the Minidoka War Relocation Center, never heard of it. He says, uh, go see the Chamber of Commerce lady. So I went to see the Chamber of Commerce lady, and, and they guided me to this lady, and uh, most of them said they never heard of it. And this lady, I don't know if you remember in the old days, I don't know if, I, if you want to cut this out, but in the old days, if you want to buy condoms, you walked in the, in the kind of, <clears throat> and then the sort of reach under the counter. <laughs> now they're all displayed all over, right? But then uh, she, I, she said, I want to know. She says, oh, she says, just a minute. And so she reached under the counter and pulled out this map, which was a, was a government map, map back, back, and it showed the camp layout. And, so, and he says, here it is. Here's how to go. And he said, go up there. Turn take an exit number, something, such, and go north. And, da, da. and she sort of took out this little map. And then she quickly put it away. And that was the end of our conversation. And... Uh, you know, this is, 19, well, this is 1988. It was my 40th, 50th class. No, it was about my 40th class reunion. I graduated out of the little town and I'm, uh, before we relocated. But anyway, yeah. And uh, so I went up and took a look at what, what there was, of, what was left of the camp. But it was kind of interesting that those two places, you know, I had, I had this same thing happen. When I was in the service, I, went to, I was in, stationed in, uh, in Austria. And I wanted to see one of the concentration camps at Daha. Daha, okay. 
And the, my best buddy spoke flawless German. He, he is another story, but he came from Ohio, Sandusky, Ohio. So he and I used to travel around tonight. We used to go see him, and he was real handy. So we went to Dachau, and we asked the guy, we had lunch there, and, and we asked to wait, wait. I said, where's Dachau? Next first day, I don't understand what you said. And, well, Schmidt, uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, just next first day, I don't understand. And uh, so Carl spoke high German, and he said, Dada, where is this camp? I said, oh. He says, why you go down the road? But, you know, we don't, we, you know, but they didn't want to tell you about it, talk about it. And hell, it's bigger, you know, so it was a national museum even then, and it's just bigger. But they still didn't? Absolutely. See, and that's what I was going to say. The experience you had was no different than, than what the Germans were. Oh, it was never here. We yeah, never knew anything no. about it. It never happened. It never. So it is. It's just a. Just a no, I think it was a. Denial. A denial, yeah. It's a denial, yeah. And, uh, but camp in Minidoka was a little different because that was run by the federal, by bureaucrats. And, uh, so was that gun protected? Like. Uh, I uh, no, we. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. We're out in the middle of you know the ten men, uh, relocation camps that the government established were in the worst places. Uh, was the the uh, the <laughs> if you <laughs> yeah, terrible places, the worst places they could pick for 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 uh, for for, and that's where they had it. And my mother, I remember, she looked and she grew up in you know she lived in the northwest and she doesn't she didn't speak English. She doesn't speak. She, she died in '94, a couple, just a year ago. But she didn't speak English very well, and never did. And but she understood, but she could not speak. And I remember we pulled up to this god awful place in the middle of the desert out by Twin Falls, Idaho. And it was the end of the siding of the railroad stop, right in the middle of this no place, nothing except a bunch of buses were waiting for us, and they took us off. The, and my mother said this. I had not took all this now. I mean, it's a terrible place. And in the sagebrush and tumbleweeds and all this god awful place, they created this camp to hold. And the, all the others were just about the same, same thing about there. But uh, then we started, then we lived in camp for three years. And then we had our own government, we had our own farms, we did everything. And every so often, you could go get a pass to go to Twin Falls, Idaho. And so, day pass. And it was all part of the scheme to get people to assimilate themselves, become more acquainted going back. And my dad went to left camp. My dad had a very important job, my dad, see, uh, in camp. And uh, see, if you were, uh, I worked one, two summers out on the farm, the camp farm, and I got paid $8 a day, eight, $8 a month, excuse me, $8 a month and as, as a juvenile, as kids working. And we worked on a, uh, McCormick Deering uh, Combine, and if you know anything about combines, if you, we used to jig and sow and sow uh, both wheat and we uh, jigged and sowed uh, soybeans. We used a lot of soybeans, and so the farm, we had a huge farm, so we jigged and sowed, and you learned how to sow the back, throw the, off the old combine. And then the common laborers got picked, paid $16 a month, and my mother worked as a waitress in, in one of the community, in the, in the mess hall. And she got $16 a month. My dad, he was head of the sewage treatment plant. As you know, as I maybe should mention, I used to, I worked most of my career with the Department of Ecology. So that must have been, it had to do with the fact that she, he, he became the foreman of the sewage and he didn't know beans about sewer treatment plants. But he ran the sewage treatment plant that serviced almost 9,000 people in this camp. And, and he was, he got, I think he got 19 bucks. The same level as doctors and lawyers and all the professional people got nineteen dollars. That was the highest wage that was paid. And not only that, he got to drive a pickup truck, and you know it was about a nineteen forty one or thirty nine Chevrolet pickup truck. And so we used the equipment, the trucks and so forth were all from CCC, CC days and war sur uh, surplus trucks and vehicles and everything. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's amazing. So so basically, they set up a little city. Yeah. And then the, the government still funded it. Yes. That, but then you developed your own governing body. Yes. To a certain point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. a certain point. Yeah. Yeah, we had block managers and so forth. And we had schools and 
Uh, we had schools, and we walked five miles to school every day because there was no transportation system. We, I learned that the main transportation were these old war surplus CCC uh, trucks, like the old Army deuce and halves, the old ones, and they had the canvas top. And the kids weren't allowed to work, ride at the school, so we had to walk. But we got to learn how to catch. I learned I was five feet tall, about five, five feet three or something at that time. And we all learned, the boys did, we all learned to jump on the tailgate and hang on to the side of the canvas of the truck, really. And we learned, did you know, how to jump off of a moving vehicle? You jump off facing, facing the direction you're going. Never turn around and jump off, just sideways. You always turn yourself around and, and jump off. And that way you just keep, keep just running and just, so, so. Some of the bus truck drivers knew we did that, so they'd slow down as you went by the school. Uh, and the school was located right in the middle, middle of, uh, right in the middle of the camp. And it was five miles. And we had to go back to our own mess halls to eat lunch and supper and breakfast. So, so we had to make that five mile trip down and back twice a day. Three times a day, you know, so we had to go back home. So by the time you got to, to your mess, we, and we lived in Block 42, which is, uh, you know, extreme, was way on the one, and so it was our, our luck to be out Block 42. But we, you know, you talk about, when I was a kid, you know, when I was at your age, I was rocky through snow drifts and storms and stuff to get to school. I don't know what you're complaining about, because I'm going to be five minutes late because I have something happened to the car or something like that to get you to school. Well, I can tell you the story about five, walking five miles to school. But, uh, yeah. Do you remember hearing that the war was over? Yeah. No, we were out of camp by then. I think a couple of things happened before that. Of course, like I talked about these 18 and 19-year-old men. When you became of legal age, 18, all boys, um, all young men and women of legal age of 18 were required to sign a loyalty oath. And there were two questions, number 17 and number 18, if I remember right. And uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but do you swear allegiance to the government of the United States, yes or no? If so, number 80, if so, will you fight, would you fight or serve in the armed forces to defend your country, yes or no? And many of them signed yes, yes. And then, but there were the no-nos. And re just recently, about two months ago, Frank Abe, who's a, a cinematographer from Cairo, used to work with Cairo, he did this uh, conscience and the constitution, and he told the un unwritten story of the no-no boys. They said, no, no. And they went to McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary and served three years there until they were, until they were uh, pardoned by, the, by executive order by President Truman. Uh, but then the other half, the, those that they said, we had 300 people, young men, 18, some uh, 18, 19 year old that volunteered out of our camp. And the people said, why are you volunteering to give your life, possibly, to the United States government? And they would say invariably, I'm an American citizen. I'm an American. And the country needs me, so I'm going to go. And so they volunteered. And a lot of times it was against the wishes of their, of their East Side parents. Because they said, you dumb, dumb kid. If you're an American citizen, then what the hell are you doing in this camp? And so they went, and the 440 they became part of the 442nd Infantry Division. And pre prejudice, and the, all, most of the officers were all white people. And then, uh, just recent, just about two months ago, three months ago, they up upgraded two of the young uh, from the state of Washington. I forget how many they did told to Congressional Medal of Honors. They wanted their distinguished service cross was the highest combat. But there was never, there was, I think during the Korean War, I think there was a, one or two Congressional Medal of Honors, but never during World War II. Yeah. No, I don't, I take that back. I think there was one Congressional Medal of Honor when, during the Korean War, and they named the ship after him. Uh, but then, so they upgraded. Matter of fact, they're having ceremonies March 25th of this, uh, of this month, next month, <laughs> this month, uh, uh, and, and so for, to the honor of the two Nisei boys that, who fought in the 442, and they was upgraded to, but there was prejudice. It's just the same thing with blacks. Remember all the blacks they upgraded all of a sudden? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like... It, it, it just, it, it, especially being a 12-year-old, formative years, your dad being so young going through it, um, I mean, anybody going through what you had to face uh, 
within that, here you are, American citizen. You are working American citizens. You're taxpaying American citizens. And yet, because your skin was a little different color. Because I'm German. I mean, Schmidt. Now, if I... Had I didn't been, see any Schmitz in camp. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I'm saying is, yeah. is, is there was, you know, we were over fighting the Germans, but yet that was a whole, the European descent, oh, no big deal. But for some reason, the wit we take, we put it... Did, when your dad, when you got out of camp, did your dad... Did he hold animosity? Or I mean, this is what amazes me to, to listen to this pride. These people that say yes, yes, they volunteer at eighteen. They go in and they fight for this company that basically just crapped on them. They go over there and they say, "Because I'm an American, I'll fight." How did your did you ever talk to your dad about how he felt? Or my dad was eligible for the draft, although he had five kids, and uh, so they never did call him. I should tell you. You, uh, I forgot some. Right after Pearl Harbor, December seventh, all over the Japanese community in Seattle and all of the West Coast, people, were, the FBI had their lists and they started picking them off. And a lot of them, uh, my uh, Buddhist church priest, never saw his family all during the war. And after the war, he finally came back and he was placed in another type of higher detention camp, like they had in Texas City and they had also the one in Montana. And then I saw oh, he's in Montana, but we knew then exactly. And so there were families that went to the relocation, the whole camp process, without the head of family because they were found to be supposedly been, you know, and there was no trial just because your name wasn't. They had hearings, I think, and then they said they. So in the middle of the night, the knock came on. It's like seeing the movies, the Gestapo knocks on the door and hauls you out, your dad. Or, and that happened to us, too. He, they came, I think it was about a, Two weeks after Pearl Harbor, near the end of December, did you hear, you know, if I said, oh, did you hear Mr. Inouye got caught? They picked him up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was going all over. And they came to our house, knocked on the door at night, and no papers, no warrant, no subpoenas. So Mr. Kiyuchi, yeah, I said, would you come with us? And we kind of looked. So and we didn't know how long he's going to be gone. Fortunately, he came back two days later. And they decided to let him, you know, but... Uh, it, it was the start of my, I think, the, the, uh, of my father. He, he wasn't bitter, but I think, you know, you're 36 years old and you come out of camp at 30, 39, and I'll tell you something, Carl. Everything, by then we had, there were five, five children, one, one, one camp baby, Frank, who's the baby, the camp baby. We always say camp babies are kind of crazy. <laughs> Well, I mean, Frank is now 50, huh? something like that. He was born in 1943 in camp. And so there were five of us. Five of us. My dad went on a relocation leave and got a job in, in, near, in a, on a fruit ranch near Boise, Idaho, a little town called Emmett, what I call my hometown because I finished school, high school there and everything. And anyway, and he came to get us. There's five of us, mom and dad and the five kids. And everything we owned, and the five kids, and mom and dad, fit in the back of a half-ton pickup Chevrolet pickup truck, 1940, 39 or 40 pickup truck. Everything he owned, including his kids, fit in the back, fit in a Chevrolet pickup truck. And he started all over in 1930, at the age 39. And we worked, all of us worked on the fruit ranch, so forth and so on. Can you do it at 39? Now, see, we, we, of course, we weren't rich. I and mean, we there are other families and there are other uh, merchants and so forth that did well. And they had some, some had problems getting their business back. Some let the business, they entrusted other people to take care of their strawberry farm and Bramage Island or the farm and, 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 and the people that they entrusted couldn't be trusted. Or they failed to make, meet the taxes. See, they had an alien land law. Aliens can own it. So those that were smart, uh, the Japanese, would turn the property, put the property in their kid's name, American citizen, so we could own land, right? And a lot of them they trusted and trusted to some. And so the people, there were examples of people just let the place go to hell and then so claim back on taxes. And so they pick up the land. So you know, those are worst case scenarios, of course. But everybody started the same way. You know, they all, some had kept them, but the three years, you know, and uh, you know, 
property values change. Sure, we got, so, and everybody says, well, you can, uh, we got, the, after all this about the illegality of the Army making this decision, after all the soldiers, I forget how many died in the World War II, uh, I, had to, I have the numbers someplace, uh, but, uh, and the hero, hero is their heroism and our determination to come back. Uh, we got the civil rights, as you know, the Mike Lowry, was the first one to introduce it, and the, the bill didn't go anywhere. But was, he was the first one to introduce the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1986 finally passed, and it's a redress. And you gotta remember, there's a difference between compensation and redress. And they said that we did wrong, and I have a letter from, I gave it, you know, signed by George Bush with a, and they issued a formal apology. And I think there was 100, approximately 120,000 were involved in the relocation, and all the 120,000, you have to remember, Carl, about 87,000 were American citizens. American citizens. Wow. And I, I, think, I think the redress payments of $20,000 each, I think the, the, the curtain's closed on it now, but I think about out of the, uh, I think uh, the 120,000 that were involved, I think they paid somewhere off about 75,000 or something were paid off. We're given, not paid off, so we're given the redress payments of 20,000. Right. I gotta just do one thing. Butter and jam was, because see, we did everything Japanese style, and so every day after come off, come off home from school, she'd be home and she made peanut butter and jam. She made us, taught us how to do uh, French toast. You know, we make toast with butter and they put cinnamon on top with the cinnamon sugar on it. And, you know, and, she, and she's the one that took us to the library. You know, things like that. So she was, a, I give her, you know, she was kind of the opening door for our family. Gosh, what a, I, um, it's, it's interesting because a mix of, of, oh, that was it. So when you left and you moved to, to Emmett, Idaho, yeah. And you went, you started going back to, were you in high school by yeah. then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you face prejudice at that point? I mean, were no, I, I, well, yeah, no, it was a small town, and uh, I think there was a population somewhere around 5,000. Uh, I think the entire county is 5,000, I think. But I think I've got to give credit because there was a, two Japanese families that lived there before the war, and they were not, never involved. And they're very well known within the community, though they were the Hosodas and the, what was the other ones? And one of them, uh, uh, he, they lost two sons. Fighting. Fighting for the United States Army. And they lost two of them. So the, so the, you know, so the Japanese, I won't say were accepted there or anything like that. But I've had, yeah, I've had things happen there yeah, that you don't talk about too much. It's just one guy, he was, uh, I was at the local, I was, I was probably a senior in high school, and I was kind of an athlete in a, you know, in a small town. You know, it was like a, like a big, big frog in a small <laughs> pond, like if you're the leader. Uh, tonight on Washington, but I think I was. I think I, I carried a chip on my shoulder, and I never told anybody where I was, where I came from, and I entered my high school in my in my sophomore year. Uh, so I didn't tell anybody where I was from. I just I was came from Hunt Idol. I called it Hunt Idol, and that was the post office box. It was the main local war relocation center was located at Hunt Idol. Hunt was the name of the okay. post office drop. So I said I came from Hunt. And, uh, and that's about all I said. And I was, and I didn't want anybody to ask. So I, re I think re all of us worked hard to uh, be better than anybody else. So I was very active in school and within the community, did a lot of things. But yeah, I had more than once that you know people said something about being a Jap. And, and uh, one time I remember my brother and I went to a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we lived about, oh, three miles from town, so we'd ride our bicycles to town and go see the movie, my brother and I. And we'd stop by the President's Fountain, which was the confectionery. In those days, in the, four, in the 40s, 45, 46, 47, uh, was the, confe the local, so, you know, back in the 50s, you know, that, 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 that whole bet, you know. Uh, but we, uh, so I was having, so we, you know, we knew the owners by name, anyway, and uh, and the son was in school, I think grade higher, so I knew the, so we stopped and had a cherry Coke, everybody had cherry Cokes at that time, before we headed back, and I go to my, and this white gentleman came up, and he was obviously, he's kind of drunk, I think he, I think he was drunk, 
and he sat down next to us, and we were sitting at the counter, and we were talking to our friends and so forth and so forth. And, and he said, did you ever see one of these? And he pulled out his wallet, and he showed it to me. And I said, no, I've never seen one of those. It was a Jap hunting license issued by the state of California. It was fake. It was a Jap hunting license, and it gave him the right to sh And, uh, you know, what can you say? You're 15 years old, and you think, oh, okay, there's nothing you can say. And uh, I know Mrs. Grattan came over and says, what's going on here? And, and he told him to get the hell out of here, told the guy to get out of here. But I remember that. There's, and then there's, oh, yeah, I, no. but it's very subtle. It's very subtle. Uh, but Because that seems, because <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting dynamics to the, the whole issue. In fact, even as, as I've started on this project, um, to find and talk to different Japanese American citizens, and I may be reading it wrong, but I feel a, a, still a very, um, very close community. And a lot of people that I've talked to to find out they want to don't want to. They've either wanted to put it behind them, they don't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm misreading. No, it. yeah, I, I think that's part of the culture. I don't know how far that goes, but then, like I said, I'm unusual that I've, I've been interested in, and I always start my preface, my remarks when I give the talk. Like I said, I didn't go, to, I didn't go public with this thing until about 1984, and uh, I regret that I never told my daughter, who's 35 years, she, never, she picked up pieces and bits, and it's kind of hard for her to understand. And here she's 39, well, she's about your age, right? She's 42, uh, that such a thing did happen. And so I always preface my remarks as, as this is part of the chapter of American history that you rarely hear about, uh, you know, and, and many people would just soon forget. And very few of the history books ever contain anything about it until just recently with the redress and with the, I think, uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of terrible movies and books written. God, even Danelle Steele <laughs> wrote one <laughs> about this. You know, uh, I couldn't get through it, but I've well, got it in my collection of stuff. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it goes back to my. You know, we don't make waves. My 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 talk is when I give is is called to gaman. Gaman is Japanese means to endure. Or, or what is it the Jap uh, what we say around here to not uh, uh, to uh, anyway you, you to endure to, to tolerate tolerate yeah yeah it. yeah to suck it up suck it up I think is one of the things uh, we would say today I guess in my, in my, in my, but yeah there's a uh, and there was a lot of shame somehow or the other I was ashamed that I was in the camps that we and you know we don't want, we I always grew up anyway my, in my generation, my mother's, uh, my folks' generation, not to make waves. Don't stick up high. Don't stick up high. And, and my, my my sister used to be really upset with me because I was so forward. I'd go, you know, I grew up after after we left Emmett, you know, I, I went to work for newspapers and I was on my own and went to service and so forth, and so I got out of the service and then we came back here to work newspapers and so on. So I used to go with my sister and she's married. She's got kids. And, and I go over to open up the refrigerator and see what the heck there's to eat. So, I mean, that's unheard of. My daughter, my sister would say, calm down, you know, slow down. Jeez, I mean, you know, if we want to give you something, we'll do it. But, but you don't do that. You don't just go walk in the guy's house, and even if it's your sister's house, and open the refrigerator and see what the hell there is to eat in the fridge for yourself. And, and she was, and I lived in a white man's, I used to say this, but I, I lived in a white man's world working for the newspaper, and I always say, and I've had, oh, professionally, I've had, you know, who the hell is that Jap, you know, who does he think he is, why is he stirring up all this trouble, and what's, who wants to know, and so forth. And I was a, one of the early, I think, I consider myself one of the early media types, Asian Americans in, in the media, although it never, you know, was in the big time, or I wasn't on the, you know, the five o'clock news or anything like that, but I worked my way. And one of the things I wanted when I worked to work for a newspaper, we couldn't afford to go to college. There was no way, and I told my dad I wasn't going to, which was probably the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. If, I, if we did what my dad wanted me to do is to lease the ranch, and then by now I probably, you know. <laughs> but no, I was too smart for that. I No, I want to be a professional. And I couldn't go to college. There was no money for that. So I went to work for a small, the small weekly newspaper in Emmett, Idaho. And, that, and I worked 60 hours a week for about 60 hours a week working in a small 
day, a weekly newspaper. You do everything, including taking photographs with a four by five. But it was an educational process, so so I did that and I learned how to, and I worked for thirty five dollars a month. This is nineteen forty eight. So instead of working toward the farm and ranch and leasing the ranch and everything like that, I decided to make something of myself because there weren't many Japanese in the business, and I wanted to, I don't know, and somehow or the other, I've been. It's, it's been a rewarding, but it's an interesting. I also get involved, can, can move to Olympia, I got involved in the state government, and there aren't that many Asians at that time. I gave a talk to Thurston leadership, leadership Thurston County, about two, week, two, three, two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, and tell them how it was uh, alarming to me that when, we, when I first started working for the state, that most of the uh, Asians and blacks, people non, non-white that are, were in state government, all lived in Seattle or Tacoma in the community. Very Why few, so? very few lived in in, in Philadelphia. There's more now, of course. There's a lot more now. But, but yeah, but if you go back, the, the, even the seventies, it was still the, the there was actually redlining by the realtors. And at that Thurston County leadership, I, I challenge anyone you that's in the realtor business to tell me that I'm wrong. There was a very subtle. You couldn't get if you and I. And I very deliberately, when I moved here in 1964, I very deliberately picked the North Thurston School District to live in because that's where a lot of the non-whites, population, of course, uh, North Thurston is about 30% are non-white kids. I mean, Olympia is still a pretty white community. Yeah, they're, they're, I've got figures on those. I looked it up in my statistics, I think. Yeah, they're, they're basically white. Tumwater is whiter yet. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, and uh, it exists. In very, I'm... Uh, my wife and I have been married uh, 37 years or something, and that makes us one of the earlier ones of interracial marriages. And we, and my daughter went through it too, but we tried to shout at her. But then, little subtle things go on. I don't know. I don't know what this has to do. But subtle things happen, like you walk and wait in line to eat at the Bud Bay Cafe, or some of the nicer places around here, so-called nicer places, and, and they kind of. So I, we, we always make reservations, and I always make it under Bev. That's Beverly. That's my wife. Yeah, yeah. If they say Atsushi, but they could tell. I'm sure my accent. Everything. They say I have an accent. I can't believe it. But <laughs> they could tell I'm Asian. But, uh, but I. It's funny. I see myself through white people's eyes. I don't see myself as being different. I never have. I've seen myself as being white. Strange. Maybe it's a protective covering that you do. But, but I. I was going to ask that. What? You, I mean, because. Or do you see, you know, they always say, people say, well, we should be colorblind, but there's argument. No, we, we can't be colorblind because there are black people, there are white people, there are Asian people, there are, you know, there is color. Yeah. You know, so being colorblind doesn't, but so, so growing up, I mean, did you think of yourself as Japanese, as American? Did you see your... I think it's a good question because, Carl, because... I think when we lived in the, when I was growing up in Seattle and stuff, we always knew ourselves being Japanese because we were Japanese and that was the people we worked with and dealt with and everything. And camp, that's all there was, was Japanese. And then, so making that transition to the white world is what I call it. I mean, I'm not a sociologist on this thing at all, but I made the transition to the white world by moving to Emmett, Idaho, relocating. And suddenly I became white. I thought I was white. And I didn't see myself as being anything else. And, uh, and uh, and uh, you know I had little very little to do. I used to speak Japanese, but I've forgotten it completely, just about completely, uh, because I never used it. Yeah, it's kind of. But uh, yeah, it, it, that's another issue I think for do, another day. Do you know if your dad, um, when, when Pearl Harbor happened? I mean, is it like you think of those Japanese and these Japanese, meaning? Those Japanese that are in Japan and grew up in Japan, and these Japanese who moved to, to America, and or is it just all the same? I, I think at my, I think as you got older, I think there was there was a connection with the home country, you know. But not not for me when at my at my age. I know my <coughs> funny thing happened uh, when the war. We had to turn in all our, you know, seditious materials and, and records of Japanese songs and. Cameras. We had to turn the cameras and uh, short radios and uh, powerful shortwave radios because we would be spying and all that stuff, right? According to General Dewitt. But anyway, funny thing happened. My 
my mother, I told you, she was uh, five daughters, five sisters, and then she had this brother, the baby brother who took over. But he was in the Manchurian War. Uh, and he was in uh, Manchuria. The Shino, what is the Shino Chinese? Not the Shino, it was the, when they were Japanese were conquering, taking over Manchuria and all that stuff. And, uh, and he was this officer. And so we had this picture of my, bro my, my, with, with my uncle, right? With his sword and, and dressed, not, was, he was dressed in his dress uniform, but he was, and my mother had this. We, we kept that picture. We hid it. <laughs> They're going to get us because we, we had an uncle that was in the, in the, in the Japanese Imperial Army, you know. And it was really kind of, it was kind of fun and humorous. But then we, we kept that all during the war. And my mother, my mother went back to Japan. Remember, she came here when she was 18 years old. And after the war, things, you know, the 1942 or 1952 or 53, the Japanese Buddhist Church, which my mother was a, uh, a Boy Scout troop, of which my brother-in-law and my nephews belonged to, made a tour to, to Japan. And so my mother hooked on at that at the lower rate as a package deal, and then she went back to the village. She went back to the village. And I said, and so it's always been, you know, so, you know, in my own mind, I said, well, Mom, when, you know, when she came back, you know, how was it, da, 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 da. And I said, well, Mom, you know, it's been the tradition uh, that Issei's, you know, after they die, their ashes are taken back by one of the members of the family back to their home to be buried at their home. So one day I said to my mom, I said, well, if you, when you die, you know, you want a Sony or me or somebody to take you back, you know, your ashes back to Japan. She says, no, I don't have no reason to go back there. I don't want to live out there. This is where I live. This is my country. She says, no. He says, no, I don't want to go there. Well, that was tradition. You know, you all took the ashes back. What the? No. Did, did, did you have, uh, do you know if your dad had relatives that were oh, yeah. fighting in World War II? Uh, uh, I don't know that. I, I, I've got to assume that he did. I don't know. I don't know. Because that seems that would be. Oh, there's been some stories about how people who went, uh, older people, older people, I mean 18, 19 years old, uh, that's that's a uh, <clears throat> there's a story a couple stories going around with uh, the Garfield High School or Broadway High School classmates that went back to Japan and fought and met yeah there's a classic story about met one of the white guys that went to school with them yeah uh, that was not unusual not I mean I've heard several instances of that kind of incident occurring see and those are the two things we've tried to find I've tried to find which I haven't yet. Uh, uh, a Japanese American citizen that's fought for mm -hmm. the 447, is that 442. Right? 442, yeah. um, to get that perspective of it. And I'd also like to interview a, a, a Japanese soldier who fought for Japan, which, is, which would be more mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah, because difficult, yeah. And, Especially they'd have to come back. And some of them don't want to talk about it either. Yeah. And my belief yeah. is. You shouldn't have any trouble with the 442, because they're well organized, called the Nisei Vets. And, they can tell you, all, you know, they can lead you to a whole bunch of people. Because we've been trying to track it. Well, you say vets are organization. I, I have, matter of fact, I've been invited to the, up, you know, the Congressional Medal of Honor thing on March 25th. And okay. then you say vets. I'll, I'll give you, I'll leave a message. I'll give you a phone number. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, there's, they're well organized and they're all dying off real fast. You know, like all World War II vets. 400 yeah. a month. But they're, they're still, they're still around, around Seattle. Yeah, I can give you. Quite a few people. My mom had a, a, went to high school with a gentleman, and they discovered later he was a, a, a and he left just prior to the war, mm. and he was a, a general mm. over there. Yeah. And unfortunately, of course, he's passed away. Mm. Now. I call my mom Woof Wham. <laughs> so, but uh, um, do, do you think that the, looking ahead to generations that you're never going to meet, that I'm never going to meet, the great 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 grandchildren? Is there a message from World War II to leave with, with those? I, I, you know, people said that, you know, was the evacuation wrong and was it right and so forth. And I think it's like, and having worked for government for so long, you know, has been a pretty good bureaucrat. Emergency times take emergency measures, okay? But you should never forget the due process. And that's the argument. Due process. What else, else is there if there isn't? Due process. If we can't do it by the Constitution, May, and and in this particular case, it was, this thing, whole thing was prefabricated. The reason for doing that, and the courts have proven that. Their own, our own courts have proven that. But the due process, and don't forget, the civil liberties, uh, civil rights, uh, the 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 emergency. What is it they call it? Led to Executive Order 9066. That thing is still in the books. 
And then, you know, and as you know, with the, uh, with the Saudi Arabia thing and all those things that have been happening, you know, there's always been threats. We should round those guys up. That's the first thing we always say. Oh, we should round those guys up. Those terrorists, they're killing the Jews. And, and so I think, th you know, so, but I would, in the same thing, I would have hated to have been in, down, uh, in Twin Falls, you know, we used to go down from camp. And when they showed the movie uh, The Purple Heart by Dana Har uh, Andrews and all that about the, how the ex Japanese executed the uh, uh, Doolittle bombers, you know, when things like that happened, man, they closed up the camp. Nobody could get out for our own, basically for our own protection. So one of the things you have to look at is, is, is uh, in a community this like uh, Olympia, what would happen, you know, if something like that happened and, and we were still out in the streets, you know, we weren't this thing that, that happened. So it worked both directions. We always used to see they put up a little machine gun, 30 caliber machine gun at the corner of the Camp post at Camp Harmony. What they called that Camp Harmony was Puyall. Somebody with a, some bureaucrat with a, with, a, with a. You know what that reminds me of? Over in Dachau, and most of the kind of says, "Work and he shall be free." Yeah. Arbeit and uh, do free or something like that. And this uh, so when we saw this guy came out, the soldier had this 30 caliber machine gun sitting there in the, uh, right on the near near the berry patch along the perimeter of the fence and. We asked the soldiers, so what's that for us? Is that to protect, keep, protect us from them or them from us? <laughs> Which way are you going to point it if you ever have to use it? That's what we interviewed. I don't know if you know Shig Honda or not, but we had interviewed Shig had an article about him a couple months ago in the paper. Mm -hmm. and, and that's he said. He said, yeah, they told us we're putting us, they're putting us here for our protection. My question was, if, if it's for our protection, why are all those guns? Pointing at yeah. 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 Huh. Well, thank you very much. I'm thing, and so my mom. So we bought brand all brand new clothes, right? But we bought heavy shoes, you know, heavy shoes, work shoes, and heavy warm clothing because we didn't know where the hell we we're gonna go. So mom, always, so we bought all this, and this is May. We're going right to Puyallup, right? And it's in May. It's spring. It's a nice spring day. And, and I said, why are we buying all this heavy warm clothes? She says it's it's easier to take stuff off. And to, to not have it when you needed it. It's just it's easier to... Wise woman. Yeah, yeah. She was, do you remember... Because uh, each person got yeah. whatever you could carry, yeah. right? Do you remember what you had in your... The one thing I got to take, you know, that was my own, other than, you know, the, the, the clothes and so forth. But the one thing I got... And each of us was allowed to take something. That, and I took my little baseball glove. That's what I took with me. Another irony... The American sport, baseball. Yeah. What well, was it? Now, when they you left by bus, right from yeah. Seattle? Did they? I know that on some of the trains that they put blinds. And yeah. Start, did they do the same thing on that? No, when we went. To, no, when we went to, uh, to Idaho. Idaho, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went to. And then the funny thing is. We, was, I think was, they shuttled us off to the side all the time to get more high priority trains, and so one the morning we woke up. We were around Nampa, Idaho, or Caldwell, Idaho, or somewhere around there. And it was kind of strange because then, you know, you weren't supposed to raise the blind, so we looked and peeked into there. And we, were at the, we had stopped at a railroad station. And it was either Caldwell, Nampa, Idaho, which is, which is near Boise, and then we had another, then we go down by Twin Falls. And, look, and there's Japanese out there watching us. They had relocated, and they heard the Japanese were coming, so they, they're waiting for us to, just to see if get a view of us. Now, if you'd been Japanese and lived in Idaho... We'd probably done the same thing. Well, but I mean, you would have been... Yeah, well, we wouldn't be in camp, no. Yeah, you'd be out. No. See, that's where... It, but then, see, it was a threat to the West Coast. Yes. That's what it was, see. And Bainbridge Island guys, you know, they, I've got copies of press clippings that somebody accumulated. I've got lots of... If you want some photographs or some data or stuff like that, let, let me know to supplement the, Oh, good. Because uh, I've got stuff and... Uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, I've got stuff like that. But anyway, uh, it's kind of funny because this is just my perspective, and you got to understand that. See, I, if you talk to probably a twenty-year guy, a person that was twenty years old at that time, it'd probably be totally different, and not different, but it'd be uh, it'll be a different approach. I think. Well, would. and and that's what this. I build this project as Honda is older, wasn't he? She yes. Honda. Yeah. yeah. I build as World War II as told by whoever's talking because that's it. I want to see, to 
different perspective, different thoughts. Well, that was my question. You talked about being a 12-year-old boy, girl smoking and all that. Did the camps allow your adolescence to, to happen? Did you get that part of your childhood or being in this? No, I don't think I was any different from if I lived in Seattle at that time. You know, growing up with your buddies and da-da-da-da-da-da. And, and the one time we... We were in many do uh, in the at the, where we lo at the location center Twin Falls. There was nothing you could go through the desert, and the closest town was a town called, ironically, Eden, Eden, Idaho. It's in the, it's in the book. It's in the map. You look, it's Eden, Idaho. Matter of fact, I was, and we walked, and, and they, well, you said something about fences initially. Well, they tried to put up fences, you see, and then after a while they gave it up for two reasons because they saw how the futility of it. There's no place to go. I mean, you, so one day. The, the gang of us, the boys that hung around, uh, we played about five of us of our gang from our block. We walked about 15 miles across the desert to go to Eden, Washington. And we went to Eden. There was just a gas station there at that time. A uh, gas station, maybe a restaurant and a post office. Maybe that's all. It was just a wide spot in the road. And, and we walked into the, grocery, into the gas station. And they used to have pop. Am I keeping you for something? I'm just kind of bullshitting you. <laughs> but they had the, 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 you know, remember the pop machines? You put a quarter in or dime, and then you pull it off yep. with the rack. Well, okay, right, all right, okay, good. Yeah. So we walked over, the, and we all had our dime, and we put it in there and pulled out our pop, see? And the big pop, big deal. I mean, that's a big deal. And the guy came out to look at the three or uh, four or five of us sitting there drinking our pop, and he kind of gave us a dirty look. And so we drank our pop and very carefully stacked it up there and walked back. <laughs> it took us about three, four hours to get, but we just did it to do it, just like boys do. We just did it to do it, just say so we could do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we, yeah well, I was talking about the fences. So what they, the Army and all its infinite, the Department of Government and all its infinite, infinite wisdom, it worked in other camps, but they decided to put guard towers up, space them out about every five miles, about every three miles all around, guard shacks, see. And the one thing that we needed really badly in camp was wood. Because we had to make our own furniture. You see, the rooms are 20 by 20. We're about this big, about 20 by 20. And that's where one family lived, and it depends how big of the family were. There were in each barracks, there was what? Uh, this going much. Anyway, there were barracks, and then there was A, B, C, D, E, and F. There were six units. And they all by they ranged in size from 16 by 20 to 20 by 20, and then the smallest ones were about 14 by 20. Okay, and and so it depends on the size of your family. See, so you had, so you're in there and you have to build your furniture, right? And so we put all the beds. Oh, the room was just about here, and we put the beds, all the beds here, and put a protect, you know, screening, got a sheet or something, and run a wire and strung it up there to. Hide it, and, that, and then the, for the girls had on, slept on this side, then we put another mom, put another one for the boys on this side. And, and then there was a big pot belly stove, and, the, and then the one light thing that came down. For the, that, that, was, that was it. That was the room that we had. But we had a big family, so we also had room A. Uh, we had unit A, which was about, like I say, about oh, 14 by 20 or 16 by 20 around there. And we had this big uh, room B. So that's how we lived. And so we, we were pretty, because we were a larger family. We had all this extra space. See. But you had to buy furniture. See. I mean, you had to get furniture. See. So we used the Montgomery Ward catalog to buy clothing and so forth. And we had a canteen, which didn't provide. It was just a canteen. It didn't have any. So wood was the most valuable commodity. And we used made furniture, uh, drawers, dresser drawers, and guitars. Guitar, you know what guitar is? It's like a wooden. It's a, like a wooden. It's made out of, if you took a two by four. It's a Japanese oh, slipper. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Getas. and everything from getas to uh, you know uh, to uh, dresser drawers and stuff like that. But so going back, so the contractor guy gets out there and he's got these beautiful pieces of wood, you know, for the guard towers. And the guard towers are what the legs are what sixteen by maybe fourteen or twelve by twelve or sixteen, and this beautiful wood. See? And he goes out there. And he, we, no, we're not, you're not photo again. And then he goes out there and he dumps all this out there to start construction, right? Pours the concrete stuff down and everything, got the base the foundations down. And the next morning he comes down there, they're gone. And the guys are packing this stuff off as far as, and they're, you know, laborious and there's no electric 
thing. And they're laboriously cutting this for 12 by 12s and 14 by 14 into usable pieces of lumber, you see. <laughs> and, and, and so they, they tried that, and then so they had a hell of a time. Uh, and they called soldiers finally to protect the dam. Out in the desert, they're protecting this lumber from a bunch of Japs that's going to steal all their lumber. <laughs> and they finally gave it up. They finally gave it up. Guard tower. Yeah, guard tower. That was not a. It was not really feasible to put a guard tower because <laughs> there was a big irrigation ditch, a big irrigation canal, a huge Milner Goodney Canal, which is a main huge, and that was well, on one side boundary. You see, and the rest was all sagebrush. Well, like you said, where would you go? <laughs> you know, you're gonna hike back to Seattle from there. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, uh, it sounds like basically they did the same thing to you that, that we did to the American Indians. They found a cruddy piece of land. Big, big difference though. The American Indians have never been given redress. That's right. I did a paper for uh, Evergreen when I did the paper on this. Also, the blacks have never had re redress. They're entitled to redress, not a compensation. They're entitled. To for what we've done to them. Yeah. It still hasn't happened. Oh. But we are lucky. We are lucky because we had people. Oh, it's it's interesting. Uh, uh, I'm on the capital furnishings, state capital furnishings committee by statute, and we're trying to protect. And the young lady that represents general administration is a girl named a lady named Mary Grace Jennings. Mm -hmm. Quiet, the very pregnant now, young lady. And one, well, I didn't, and so we went to committee meetings. We used to talk BS. You know. Am I keeping you for some? No, I'm no, just you're, uh, no, uh, you're fine. Uh, 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 fun, uh, small world, because, and so we were working. Oh, we had a big uh, fundraiser last Thursday, uh, for to raise money to buy back and fix up all this old furniture and everything that's been given away, sold or stolen or broken or discarded. Anyway, Mary Grace said to me one day we were sitting, walking, we we're walking back. To the, she was walking back to her office, and I was uh, going to the. Anyway. I said, were you in the internment camps? I said, sure. I said, yeah. He says, that's strange. He says, I was on a member of the committee of the committee on civil rights that drafted and they had, they had the public hearings, the congressional hearings throughout the United States. He said that was. A, I said, I really learned a lot. I, you know, from, from just being a staff member, just one of the you know the da da with her college degree. She said she had a college degree in Asian history or something, and she was in California and she got an appointment. That blah blah blah. But she had been knocking around. And she's still a young lady. I think she's probably in her 40s now, 39, 40. But anyway, she said, yeah, I was, I was traveling. I said, tell me this, confirm this one story for me that I heard about, about, uh, about the signing of the Redress Act. And this is the 20,000, you know, that on the Paul former part. And I said, I heard this from one of the people in Seattle, Japanese people who were involved in the Redress movement, that they passed the bill, Congress passed the bill, and they had to get President Reagan, he was the president then, to sign it in a cer appropriate ceremony. And he was, of course, the governor of California. And he, was, he became a big shot for the, for the, through the rich and influential people in California. The golden sons and the golden and native sons of California, which are big. And they're the ones, and don't forget our very liberal Supreme Court, War, uh, Doug, not Douglas, uh, the Supreme Court judge who became the United States Supreme Court judge was Governor Cal Earl Warren, Warren yeah, the yeah. great, the great, great liberal, right? And he was the governor that pushed to get the Japs out of during World War II. See, you know, pushed the Japs and move them out of there. To anyway, so all these politics are going on. They said, they said, I said that story I heard, uh, Mary Grace and I, I heard that it became very tricky because it passed, see, and they weren't sure what side of the plate. Reagan was coming on this thing, and because it was California background, all that stuff, see? And, and he said, and this is the story I got, and uh, Mary Grace, he wasn't the brightest, quickest uh, president we ever had. And he said, and he, the way to get him to do something was to get him to associate things that happened in his younger days or his pre prior commitment. You know, if he brought up something that has to be signed, it was signed today, da 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 da, we're doing this today, you know, his, his, uh, his was it the, what's it called memory, long term memory, was better than his short term, what's what happening. So to brief him on it and to not embarrass, they said what they did is one of his cabinet members briefed him and basically said this Governor, uh, President, Mr. President, do you remember when you were a governor and the California legislature honored this soldier? from California, Japanese American soldier, you know, and, and for his heroic deeds or whatever it was in the Cal and you signed the proclamation. He says, Oh yeah. He says, Well, 
Mr. President, his family will be one of these people that would benefit. And he said the two and two clicked, and that's all he needed to know. I see. <laughs> and I said to Mary Grace, just a couple weeks ago, did this really happen? She said, it really happened. Wow. And she was on, she was just one of the aides or so, whatever you want to call it. Just, yeah. But was there and saw that, wow, huh. Yeah. It's interesting the, the, how the politics all, on top of everything else, play into it. It's interesting. It's like uh, when you adopt a child, you never tell anybody that, you know, generally to the, it's none of your damn business, right? And we did that. Uh, uh, but anyway, but then, you know, somehow you get around some or the other way, some casual conversation, you bring up that your child's adopted. And you'll be surprised the number of people that have adopted children that you never know about. And the same thing about this thing, this war thing, you know. You have the just mention of somebody drops something and it's, oh, even if he's, even if he's a hagujin or a white person, it, somehow or the other, they, they have, people, people say, oh, yeah, I remember that. We had the, I've always wondered, uh, the... Evelyn Iratani, I think that's her name, used to be a PI reporter, business reporter, and she wrote a book about Port Angeles and the James River, James River Company, who bought the, uh, who, who who sold out to Daishoa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Daishoa in Port Angeles. Well, you'll you'll get that when you go to Port Angeles. But that was the old Crown Zellerback Mill, and I know. Yeah, and Crown, Crown, Crown Z. Crown Z. It was Crown, Crown Z, Zellerback. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, but. And, and Evelyn E. Rotani wrote the book, and it's, I forget what the name is, it's just around. You could, but it tells about how Daishoa, the Japanese influence, uh, you know, da 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 da. And, but then, then she goes back to the Asian ties, how the fact the first Asians from, uh, from Japan washed up on the shores of Nia Bay, on Shai Shai Beach. Now, okay, now answer this then. Because my brother heard the story that they were taken as, as um, slaves. Yes. For the okay. Indians, yeah, yeah. Because the lady from Nia Bay was telling yeah. us a couple of years ago, this tour bus pulls up, yeah. and about 150 Japanese <laughs> yeah, get out, with and camera. they're coming there to look and see where they were slaves. Yeah, that's right, that's right. God, we're a small world. Yeah. But, uh, so, I, so I was into, you know, so I read Evelyn's book, and I started reading, it's all about Port Angeles, see? And he quotes Sam Hagwood. Sam Hagwood, if you've been down Port Angeles, used to be Hagwood's restaurant right on the dock there. And he and I played ball. We were all, I was, what, 23 years old when I moved to from Oregon, who was working for a paper in Oregon, <coughs> working for the Port Angeles paper there. Anyway, and so, so we were all about 23 to 27. We all played ball. We were JCs. We were JCs, and we really made the. You know, we really we were always about that. We were always stirring up things and doing things for the communities. And, and Sam was one of the older guys, and, and Sam Hagwood. And, and when I first met Sam, he said to me, "You know, there used to be a Japanese family." They used to live here in the da 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 da, and they're in that Evelyn's book. Okay, and matter of fact, he's one of the leading people in, in, the, in Evelyn's book. And uh, then all of a sudden, he was gone. He said he was gone, and he said, you know, Sam said, uh, I don't know where he went. I understand the government moved him or something. Like that did you ever hear about these people? I says, oh, you know, and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know. 120,000 people. How the hell am I supposed to know who this? Like I was Smith or Jones was. You know, yeah. I don't know. But you're uh, Japanese. Yeah, Japanese. yeah, yeah. You, you should know. You know, <laughs> God. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, but Evelyn Ertani in that book talks talks about this Japanese family, and and he was quite a guy, I guess. And he were, he ran with Sam. They were part of the guys that stir when they were out in high school. We all stirred up things, and and he, then he Sam went on to Whitworth Whitman College. I think Whitman. I think it was yeah. And uh, anyway, so I met him after, you know, he was seeing his dad was running the restaurant by then. But then, but he always said to me first, he said, I was wondering whatever happened to the family. And so in the book, he talks about Sam and talks about, it. and it was one of the gang Japanese kids that grew up with Sam and, and it was one of the move shaker, you know, young shakers and movers in the community at that time. And, but I remember Sam saying, I always wondered whatever happened to him. <laughs> and, and I don't know, he's dead, Sam's dead now, but uh, uh. oh well. Anyway, such a small 